So this course is uh, going to be on linear and uh, nonlinear schemes for forward model order reduction and inverse problems. And so, in fact, the main object of interest uh, for the course are going to be uh, parametric partial differential equations. And uh, throughout the, uh, the course, uh, we are basically going to uh, summarize this object as an operator equation B uh, that has a solution U and that depends on some parameter thetas. Uh, the solution U is going to live in a Hilbert or a Banach space in general. And uh, the parameters theta, we are going to assume that they belong to another space that I'm going to denote uh, capital theta, that we are going to assume that it is compact. Just an example to uh, keep in mind, a, a very simple one, uh, consider uh, the Laplace problem minus uh, theta uh, Laplace, U, uh, Laplace and u uh, equals f. Theta here is uh, going to be the diffusion parameter. And uh, assume, just for the sake of the example, that theta belongs to a compact interval theta min theta max. And that, therefore, this is our this is going to be our compact space and uh, we are going to be interested in the parameter to sh solution map that take us uh, from the parameter theta to the solution u of theta that is going to belong to our Hilbert space. This is really going to be the mapping of interest for basically most of the course and the questions we are going to be interested in here are the following. So if you give me a theta, my task is first of all I'm going to be interested in solving my problem. This is going to be a forward problem. Uh, in general solving this problem for this simple example if the domain is simple of course this is no big deal but if I give you a complex system already solving this forward problem can be involved and it can take time. So I'm going to be interested in somehow replacing this parameter to solution map by something that is going to be very quick, that is uh, going to be uh, evaluated at a reduced complexity and that it is going to approximate my u of theta for all the thetas that uh, I am interested in in my range of, of parameters over here. And uh, why uh, would I be interested in uh, replacing this by something uh, less expensive? It's uh, in fact connected to the applications of these uh, parameter-dependent PDEs. They arise in plenty of optimization problems when you need to calibrate a parameter. You need to throw, for example, a gradient descent where you are uh, going to have to iterate through the values of the parameter and often the solution of a PDE is going to be involved. I'm going to be uh, required to uh, evaluate U for plenty of different parameters theta. Uh, so this uh, needs to be done very efficiently. And uh, another um, application of interest uh, can be inverse problems as uh, we are going to see in the course. And finally, another application is for uncertainty quantification. Basically, if I assume that uh, the value of my parameter theta for some reason follows a probability distribution because it is a bit uncertain, this uncertainty is going to be propagated in the outputs uh, u of theta and I may be interested in knowing what is the distribution of this push forward operation uh, or uh, interested in the uh, distribution of a quantity of interest based on my u of thetas. Okay? And so, before I forget, I'm going to introduce also uh, what we often call uh, the solution manifold. Which is going to be the set of solutions u of theta when I vary my parameters 
in my compact set of interest. Okay? So we are going to see uh, that all uh, model reduction techniques uh, that we are going to use, in fact, uh, rely on understanding uh, like the geometry of this object. So these are going to be, as I said, uh, the, the, the objects uh, of interest, these parametric uh, PDEs. And uh, in order to study them, in fact, we are going to go uh, through a journey in which we are going to make a little detour. Uh, and uh, this is the agenda to, to understand them and to understand their application to inverse problems. First of all, uh, uh, the first lecture is going to be a bit theoretical. I'm going to give some elements of approximation theory. The second part of the lecture is going to be forward problems, reduced order modeling of parametric PDEs. This is the object, the solution manifold here, is uh, going to be at the core of uh, this uh, second lecture. Finally, the uh, techniques that I'm going to introduce in the forward uh, reduced order modeling uh, part, I am going to explain how we can leverage them in order to solve inverse problems and why it is uh, really central to be able to reduce the complexity in order to uh, solve efficiently these inverse problems. And in fact, you will see that uh, we have by now very strong claims on saying that the algorithms that can be built uh, from reduced order models they can be claimed to be optimal in a certain sense. And this means that if somebody else comes with another algorithm the day of tomorrow and claims that uh, the algorithm is better than ours, in fact, it will be wrong according to the standards of quality that we will have uh, uh, agreed upon because uh, by construction, our algorithm is going to be the best one. And so the last part uh, will be a hands-on session that uh, my PhD student, Agustin Somacal, has uh, prepared. Uh, Agustin, where are you? Uh, there is Agustin. And uh, he, he'll be with us uh, in the, at the end of, of the session. So um, also, feel free to interrupt me if uh, something uh, bothers you tremendously. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, OK, this is uh, the material that we have for the course so far. I have put the slides on my web page. We have a fantastic notebook by uh, Agustin that is already online for you. And I have some lecture notes for the last part of, uh, of this course uh, that have been recently published. So let's go to uh, elements on approximation theory. Uh, here, the central notions uh, I'm going to put forward are the notions of encoder and decoder and to uh, really insist on the difference between linear approximation and nonlinear approximation. And I'm also going to discuss the role of uh, neural uh, networks as a nonlinear approximation encoder and decoder, in fact. So uh, let's go for it. So let me first define what is a linear and nonlinear approximation uh, for, uh, for the theory of approximation theory. <laughs> so, this is our Banahor uh, Hilbert space, and uh, examples of this are uh, the Euclidean space, LP spaces, Sobolev spaces. And in this part of the lecture, it's going to be slightly disconnected to parametric PDEs, but I will make remarks on why this connects and why I think it is important to have uh, this uh, first part of the lecture in mind for, for later on. And it is unfortunate that my titles are kind of hidden by this. Okay. Uh, okay, we are going to uh, study approximation and the goal of approximation is to replace a given target function u by a simpler function that is going to be easy to uh, work with in practice. And uh, the spirit is going to be that the approximation of this function is going to be searched in a set of functions, a family of functions that I'm going to call the n. And the n is going to be related to some complexity measure of, uh, the, of the given set. And this is going to be typically the number of parameters involved in, in, in uh, kind of defining the, the set. For this approximation uh, sets or families, we are going to distinguish uh, two uh, classes uh, of approximation. 
Linear approximation is when Vn is a finite dimensional linear space, meaning that uh, I am given a basis uh, of uh, vectors V1 to Vn, and I take their uh, linear span, meaning that I take linear combinations with coefficients Ci that are uh, real numbers. Examples of uh, linear approximation are, for example, polynomials, trigonometric polynomials, and fixed knot splines. Fixed uh, knot splines are uh, basically a family of functions which are, I mean, at a first approximation level, we can consider them as being in 1D, the following object. So we fix ourselves certain knots that we are going to be, that we are going to fix once and for all. And then we consider that inside uh, each of uh, the sub-intervals, uh, we have a polynomial of a certain order. This lets us uh, see this as a fixed knot spline. Uh, all these families are linear because if I take a linear combination of them, I stay in the same class. This is in contrast to nonlinear approximation in which uh, we work with sets Vn that are nonlinear. The first example is n-term approximation. Here, the spirit is the following. You give me usually an infinite, what is called an infinite dictionary of functions vi. Um, they are usually complete in, 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 uh, in v. I, I have a bunch of them, and I'm going to select n of them, but in fact, uh, I'm not going to fix them. I, I select n of them, and I consider all uh, the linear combinations uh, that I can assemble but with all the possible different combinations of the elements of my dictionary. So uh, it's, uh, it's clear that if I sum two of these objects, in fact, I am going to end up with a linear combination of two n elements that is uh, not going to, to, to belong to my Vn in general. The second uh, example, which is uh, the one we are going to focus uh, much more later on, is uh, what I call nonlinear parametric manifold. This is a set of uh, elements of uh, V, which is generated as follows. I, I am given a certain nonlinear map, D, that takes n elements in the Euclidean space, and it sends me uh, an element uh, of V. And uh, Vn is going to be uh, the set of functions of V that are generated by uh, the image uh, of this map. This map, I am going to call it a decoder because it is going to go usually from Rn n dimensional space and n, think of it as not very large, and it is going to be to V, which is typically going to be a very large space, even of infinite dimension. Examples of nonlinear approximation. So we have rational functions, free knot splines. Free knot splines are the families of functions in which I have the knots here, but now I, I admit that I can move their positions. Okay, and so this is a nonlinear approximation uh, family. And as we are going to see later on, also neural networks are going to be uh, um, uh, nonlinear uh, family, and they are they can be understood, in fact, as a family of decoders in in the way I'm going to uh, introduce later on. Uh, we are going to take the view uh, for the rest of the course that a nonlinear approximation uh, is going to be generated uh, as follows. So I can fix myself. Uh, n parameters, and I'm going to build this nonlinear approximation as follows. I'm going to build an encoder mapping that goes from my ambient space to n parameters, and a decoder mapping that takes from my n parameters uh, uh, and goes back uh, to the V, to the, to the ambient space, in such a way that the spirit is going to be that I want my U to be approximated by the operation of encoding U so I take my u, I send it, usually this is in very high dimension, so I reduce the dimension up to Rn terms, and then I enlarge again 
the dimension and I get uh, this is the encoder, this is the decoder, and then I, if I combine both of them, I'm going to get encoder, uh, decoder, and this, we want this to approximate you as good as we can. Okay? And so this uh, set a VM of uh, generated by the decoders, uh, we can view this as a parametric manifold because it is driven by this N uh, coefficients. And note as well that this encoder-decoder scheme uh, describes a process of dimensionality reduction already, which is uh, kind of uh, already starting to be connected to the main topic of the course, which is to reduce the complexity of this object or uh, this object over here. Okay. So uh, I would like to convince to you that this point of view of uh, describing approximations through encoders and decoders it's kind of a, a very general tool, and we can describe uh, most of what we are doing uh, through this kind of uh, point of view. Uh, for this, uh, for example, we can convince ourselves that in fact also linear approximations can be uh, all described by encoders and uh, decoders. Uh, let me do this on the board. I can build an orthogonal projection, I can understand an orthogonal projection in a Hilbert space as an encoder-decoder scheme. Uh, I take uh, V a Hilbert space, and so uh, our goal is to uh, express, uh, so I'm given a U in V, and I'm given a linear space Vn of elements generated by an orthonormal basis to simplify. So our goal is to express the orthogonal projection of U as uh, the operation of a certain encoder-decoder procedure. Okay? And so we can kind of easily see this because if I define my E of U as taking the scalar products of uh, my vectors uh, against the basis functions. And then if I take as a decoder, I define the sum of coefficients times my vectors of the basis, <coughs> I am getting here that I am writing my orthogonal projection as an encoder uh, decoder scheme. Okay, so this is uh, just an example of uh, manipulation uh, to, to convince you that uh, this is not a, a crazy idea uh, of, of working with this, uh, these objects. There are plenty of other examples. Uh, here I made uh, one also with compressed sensing, but it's uh, less related to, to the topic of the course, so I'm going to skip it for the sake of time. Neural networks are also going to be an encoder-decoder scheme in the fashion I will explain later on. Now, what is the goal in approximation? The goal is that you give me an approximation set Vn, your favorite one, you can give me a linear approximation set, you can give me a nonlinear approximation set through your neural network or uh, whatever you, you would like. And then for a target function u, I want to uh, understand what is the best I can do to approximate my given target function u? And so the best I can do uh, with this set is to, uh, to find the element, <laughs> to, to find the element uh, in Vn that is at uh, smallest distance uh, from my target function. And if I manage to compute such an object, I, will, uh, I would have uh, approximated at best my target function u uh, through uh, the element of, uh, of my set uh, Vn. So this uh, raises uh, plenty of questions in approximation theory, which uh, I'm going to uh, kind of uh, quickly go through. For example, if I give myself a sequence of approximation set Vn, uh, as I grow the complexity, uh, one question is, uh, does the error of approximating u uh, go to zero as uh, I increase the amount of terms? The second is the 
uh, what they uh, call the expressivity. Now, if I fix myself a certain class of functions kappa here, uh, note that, in fact, kappa could be, for example, this solution manifold, just to say, but it can be many other things. So, but if I fix myself a certain class, uh, one task is uh, going to be to determine uh, how fast the element in this class go to zero. Uh, and in particular, if I fix myself a certain target accuracy, epsilon, uh, to approximate my objects, how many degrees of freedom am I going to need in order to attain this? This is expressivity, and then uh, we can also start uh, interesting ourselves in approximation classes, which is some sort of uh, complementary question. It's about characterizing the class of functions for which a certain convergence type is achieved. Uh, it's uh, usually characterized in this form if uh, gamma n is a growth function. Think of uh, n to the power alpha, for example. Uh, this, uh, this kind of object is uh, going to characterize the functions that of my Hilbert space that decay at a rate 1 over n to the alpha uh, in, in, in the space. And finally, uh, an algorithmic question is the following. In general, if you give me a target u, I will not be able to compute the best element in the class because maybe my class is very complicated, it may be non-convex, it may be even uh, not even closed, or uh, m many crazy things can happen. So often this object is not really at reach. But if I manage to build an object un in, 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 in vn such that it only deviates uh, at a certain constant times the best I can do, if this constant c is not very large, then I'm going to be very happy because I will have produced something that is close to the best that I could have done. Okay? So these are kind of the main questions we can ask ourselves in approximation theory and that also underlying uh, all the things uh, we are going to do with our solution manifold later on. I'm going to now move to uh, not approximating one given uh, single function u, but to approximate a class of functions uh, k, uh, model class k. So to keep uh, the track of what we want to do later on, k can be this solution manifold. Okay? But it, again, it can be many other things, but later on we are interested in, in this object. So I want to uh, study now uh, the quality of working with certain encoders and decoders in order to approximate my elements in a certain class K. So we need to agree on a measure of quality of this procedure and uh, we can define this uh, often in, in two different ways. We can define uh, this uh, uh, performance in, in the worst case, which is defined over here. I take an encoder and a decoder, I, I fix them. I uh, consider their approximation of uh, the elements in my set K. And then the element that is approximated at worst is uh, going to give me an idea of how uh, the, the method with this encoder and decoder is performing. And of course, if I minimize the worst case error here, I am uh, going to, 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 to improve and improve uh, my, my approximation. Instead of working here uh, with a max over the elements of, of the compact, we can assume that uh, there's a probability distribution that uh, the elements in the compact are following and uh, instead of taking the max, we can, we can take an average uh, over here. And this leads us to, uh, to define a notion of n width. Now I have fixed a decoder and an encoder and I, and, and I can define their performance, but in fact I'm interested in uh, the encoders and the decoders that are kind of minimizing this performance, right? This is uh, going to define the best I can ever do with an encoder and a decoder involving n parameters. So this is why I put an inf here over all possible encoders and decoders 
and I, I define this notion of uh, n widths uh, associated to encoders and decoders. So now, why am I interested in introducing this? It's uh, because uh, we are going to uh, carry uh, plenty of discussions on uh, what is the best that uh, we can do with a certain numerical procedure, in particular when we are linear. And so this uh, kind of point of view is uh, going to, to, to help to kind of organize ideas. So one can uh, give uh, different names uh, to this uh, n width uh, over here, in the worst case sense, for example, um, depending on the nature of the encoder and the decoder that we are willing to use. In general, the encoder and the decoder, they can be either linear objects, they can also be nonlinear objects, they can be continuous, discontinuous. So in this whole zoo, uh, we can uh, try to uh, add some classification of, uh, of certain families. And the first uh, classification is to say, okay, now I'm fixing myself the encoders and decoders that are linear. And I define the associated and width as, uh, I mean, the same object as here, but I am, uh, in fact, kind of uh, adding the constraint that everything is linear and it reads this way and it is called the approximation numbers. Now, I can go a bit more complicated. Now, the encoder is whatever and the decoder is linear. It means that when I, when I land over here back to my Hilbert space, I am going to be working with an n-dimensional space. Okay, this is basically a, a linear approximation. And uh, the best I can do is characterized by an object that uh, many of you may have heard of. It's uh, the Kolmogorov n-width. This Kolmogorov n-width uh, characterizes the best I can do to approximate my class with an n-dimensional uh, space. Uh, one can understand it uh, easily uh, through a picture. Suppose that uh, this is my compact set uh, K in uh, my ambient Hilbert space V. Um, the Kolmogorov and width, what, uh, the, the way to, to, to read uh, this kind of uh, inf sub inf uh, beast here is the following. Fix a, fix a linear space Vn, fix an element u in k, and look at the error of approximation of this element. This is what the first inf means. So I fix myself a u in k. I uh, fix myself a certain uh, linear space Vn over here. And I look at the error of approximation between u and an element of Vn. So this is uh, going to be the, the, the first uh, error over here. This is uh, going to be u, in fact, minus the orthogonal projection of u. Now, the second uh, optimizer is a soup. So I'm going to be interested in the element of my uh, set that is the worst approximated by, by my uh, linear space Vn. In this case, this is going to be probably this object over here, which is going to give me the, the worst uh, distance that I'm going to be at from my linear space Vn. This worst uh, error here is what I denote as the distance of k to Vn. OK, over here. This, this is uh, what uh, we often understand as the distance of, uh, of the compact to, 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 to a linear space. And now, so th this quantity, if I fix a Vn, it is going to tell me, hey, this is the worst you can do when you approximate the elements uh, with a Vn. And now, what I'm going to do is to search for the best linear space that is going to minimize this distance over here. So in this example, uh, probably the best space is going to look something like this, because the element that is worst approximated here is, uh, I don't know, it's uh, going to be, say, this one over here, for which the distance 
uh, to Vn is uh, going to be much smaller than, than here. Okay, so this is uh, the Kolmogorov uh, n width, and uh, it uh, plays a critical role in uh, linear reduced order modeling because uh, there's been many works in which we approximate this set m with a linear space. And so this kind of quantity is really going to tell us what is the best that we can expect to do uh, with, uh, with a linear space. Just to insist on the fact that this object, can, this quantity can be extremely bad very quickly, uh, I can draw you another example in which uh, now consider, for example, a V-shaped uh, space. Here, the n width, it's, uh, it's the, the, the space that, uh, that is the best for the n width. I mean, it's not clear. Probably it's going to be something like this. So it's super bad. And we quickly see that here, what we feel is like a splitting the manifold into the, the, the set into two, into one. And we do a linear approximation here and do a second linear approximation over here. But this goes already in the realm of nonlinear approximation. OK? So this is just to illustrate that this Kolmogorov width can be very bad. Now let's move forward and say that there are uh, plenty of other things. Uh, now, if uh, the encoder is linear and the decoder is nonlinear, this arises uh, another uh, benchmark, which is called the sensing numbers. And, and these are connected very nicely to uh, what we can do at best in inverse problems. I'm not going to comment on this uh, for the sake of time now. And now, when both E and D are nonlinear, uh, we often call uh, the, this uh, object of uh, n width uh, approximation, we, we call this manifold width. Now, what's the catch here? The catch is that in the manifold width, I am admitting all mappings that are linear, nonlinear, continuous, and discontinuous. And the problem is that when the objects are discontinuous, when <coughs> the best I can do, the element that achieves the inf here, if it is a discontinuous mapping, what can happen is that you are very quickly very prone to be very sensitive to errors uh, related to noise, for example. And so the fact that, for example, we, we have uh, seen uh, claims in which uh, we say, yeah, we train a neural network and we do an infinitesimal uh, change and the thing completely blows up. It means that the approximation is in fact not stable. It's uh, discontinuous. And uh, we, we need to decide whether we admit this kind of behavior or not. And so this kind of behavior is uh, covered by, by in this case. <coughs> but if we want to kind of put some uh, uh, condition on how well I am robust to noise, we may want to consider something a bit less strong, which is what is called uh, often the stable manifold width, in which I am looking for encoders and decoders that are Lipschitz constant mappings for a certain uh, Lipschitz continuity constant uh, gamma. And here, sorry, there's a typo. This should be encoder over here. So. If I work with encoders and decoders that are uh, Lipschitz continuous, I'm sort of uh, robustifying uh, my approximations with respect to noise. And uh, I'm going to comment later on on the difference between these two uh, when uh, we uh, see them in, in the light of, uh, of neural network approximations. Uh, of course, we have a cascade of inequalities, the benchmark for approximation numbers with encoders and decoders that are linear, it is behaving worse than the Kolmogorov width, than the sensing numbers, and then uh, the, the manifold width. And uh, of course, uh, the stable, the approximation numbers are worse than the stable manifold width, which is worse than the general manifold width. Um, a further remark on saying that the, this Kolmogorov width I have uh, described uh, over here, uh, it has a counterpart <coughs> in average in the sense that I can, instead of looking at the worst approximation of the elements of my manifold, I can replace this by, by an average if I have a probability distribution. 
And in fact, uh, this raises uh, what I call here a weighted Kolmogorov and width. And in fact, the spaces that achieve this uh, weighted Kolmogorov width, they, we know them. They are the singular value decomposition. We can compute them. We can approximate them, in fact, because in, often uh, this integral, it has to be discretized. Uh, but, but the singular value decomposition is uh, giving us the spaces that optimize uh, the Kolmogorov width, so they are optimal in this sense. Now, there's been a lot of effort in approximation theory in characterizing how the Kolmogorov width, so the approximation with linear spaces, how it behaves within, with the dimension of uh, my linear space. Uh, and uh, here's the main result we can say uh, from, from the field. We can say that if we take the compact set k, k here to be the unit ball of a Sobolev space where I have uh, k derivatives uh, that are in LP, I know that the Kolmogorov width of uh, this Sobolev space is going to decay as 1 over n, uh, 1 over k to the, sorry, 1 over n to the power k over d. Okay, what does this mean? What does this mean? It means, first of all, the blessing of smoothness. When I increase k, I am increasing the regularity of my set and I am going to be able to approximate faster and faster for a, for a given budget of degrees of freedom. If I increase the k, I get a, a, large, a better approximation. And so I'm going to be able to approximate better and better my objects uh, for, uh, for, an economically, for an economical budget of uh, little n uh, degrees of freedom. But what happens? Uh, the, the ha the, what happens is that we are hit by the curse of dimensionality. This d over here, when the dimension of the ambient space increases, the rate is going to degrade. And this uh, leads to the, what they call the curse of dimension because if you want to approximate your object here at a certain target accuracy epsilon, if you want to relate n and epsilon, there's going to be an exponential connection between both, and uh, this is uh, the so-called curse, curse of dimension. Uh, so so th this is what is known. And another remark is to say that beyond this uh, unit ball over here and all the types of unit balls in, in other similar spaces, in fact, uh, we don't know much about how to characterize the behavior of the Kolmogorov width for uh, general sets. And so this is a problem in particular for this uh, object over here that we want to study. But uh, on the bright side, in fact, there's a fantastic uh, result uh, produced by uh, Devor, Cohen, and other co-authors in which they say that, okay, if you work with essentially an elliptic problem, uh, which is uh, kind of uh, not, uh, which is coercive enough, say, then in fact, the Kolmogorov width of this manifold is going to decay exponentially fast within. So this is a fantastic good news for reduced order modeling when working with linear spaces. The bad news is that for the rest of the PDEs, we don't know anything about it and there are negative results that say if uh, now, if I replace this one by a transport equation, I mean, the Kolmogorov width is going to behave basically like one over square root of n. So you should maybe just uh, stick to your classical forward uh, solver and uh, don't uh, try to, to do any uh, complexity reduction with a linear space because it's not going to work. So, so I, I leave this uh, to a later discussion. And uh, let me now discuss what we know about now the stable manifold width. So if I now allow myself to work with nonlinear maps that are Lipschitz, what do I know? So, in fact, I know that I have the same rate of decay that I have just commented on later on, but this rate of decay is achieved for uh, a larger class of sets than with linear methods. So, we are kind of... Uh, this proves that uh, there's an interest in going uh, to nonlinear approximation, but 
the bad news is that the approximation theory is telling us, OK, if you want to do an approximation which is robust to noise, you are going to be inevitably hit by the curse of dimension. And uh, this is something that we need to be aware of, especially when we work with neural networks, because, um, yeah, so if we want to uh, be, um, if, if we want to go beyond this and beat the curse of dimension, we have to admit that we are going to be unstable. At least this is the current state of knowledge from uh, approximation uh, theory. So it's kind of very intriguing, I would say. And uh, also, uh, regularity does not help for the curse of dimension, because even if I take a compact set which is infinitely many times differentiable, I'm going also to be hit by the curse. So it's not a problem of regularity that is there, it's uh, something more. And this something more, in my opinion, is connected to the fact that uh, the, the results, uh, this kind of results, they have been produced for compact sets that are very special, that are actually very general, and uh, probably we need to study uh, more specific and maybe more complicated classes of uh, compact sets in order to have a better picture uh, about this behavior for specific, uh, for specific encoders and decoders. Because these rates do not explain the behavior of neural networks that uh, we are seeing from the literature. And yeah, so this is why I was saying we, we need to maybe consider different approximation classes beyond these unit balls. This drives me to uh, speaking about neural networks and uh, placing them in, in, in the context of uh, the approximation uh, benchmarks I have uh, introduced. Are there any questions so far? Yeah? Sorry? It's, it's not a smooth function, it's a smooth approximation. Sorry. Like, when K is like a ball of smooth functions, yeah. what does our rate look like? Is it not like exponential? No, uh, you, you're going to uh, still be algebraic like this, even okay. for C infinity functions. Okay. I have uh, forgotten exactly the result for uh, C infinity, mm -hmm. but so you're, you're going to be, of, again, of this kind of form. Okay. We won't yeah. just have a k equals infinity? Or? No, no, yeah, you, uh, yeah, this uh, result uh, does not apply when I make k tend to infinity. Yeah. Yeah. My question is about what, what you call instability of stable. Does, does it mean it doesn't work? Or is there a mathematical definition that you can... Well, what do you mean exactly by unstable? So I have <coughs> my, my own definition of Unstable means that, yeah, basically unstable is that I am saying that you're not Lipschitz. Oh, okay. You're, you're not Lipschitz, and therefore, okay. if there's a slight change in the inputs, this could be inputs of a neural network, for example. Okay, so if, you're not, if you're not Lipschitz, the outputs are going to okay, probably so blow the, up. The, the, the constant is very large. The constant can be very large, for this example. Is, this, is, this is the definition, okay. Yeah. I yeah. can take it as the definition. In you the can context. take it as the definition if you wish. Okay, and I you. forgot to mention, in fact, uh, this uh, stable manifold width. Sorry, uh, the stable manifold width here. There's the free knot splines uh, achieve the stable manifold width. This is a fantastic result. Other so questions. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, please use the microphone. This is very useful for those who are attending uh, remotely, yeah, so they can hear the questions. It's not very practical, but we can. Okay, so in the result you have shown, uh, the space kappa is a uh, grand K, let's say is a space of um, function with norm one, enfin, smaller than one. Oh, sorry, can you say it, again? You, you consider the unit ball. Yes. So why is this choice? Because how, what does it correspond to? Unfortunately, they don't know how to produce results for 
other sets. That's, uh, yeah, that, that's essentially my answer to your question. Unfortunately, it's very difficult. Okay, good. Yeah. It, it's not very satisfactory. This is uh, what I want to convey as well. Other questions? Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, something quickly. So I think there are some results about neural networks where if the approximation that you consider as an architecture that depends on the function, so it's not going to be a fixed architecture and just parameters to find, but depending on function, you're going to have a different neural network, then there are some results that show that we can beat the curse of dimensionality. Yeah, but of I course, it's outside of this class. I am result. going to comment at the end of the lecture about this. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so if there are no, no questions, anyway, we, I, su I suggest that we move on and then we can okay. ask questions there. <laughs> so, <coughs> so, as a particular instance, neural networks can be seen as a class VN. Let me uh, discuss uh, what is known about this uh, without falling into alchemy. I, I put this originally because uh, we, we all feel there's a, there's a lot of uh, things that are unknown in, uh, with this class of functions and even uh, people from machine learning from the field that are very respected uh, are feeling that uh, sometimes it's like alchemy. And uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, th 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 this was uh, just to warm up the audience and say, yeah, okay, <laughs> there's, a lot, there's still a lot to do, right? So these are the facts that are uh, non-alchemical uh, that I have uh, gathered uh, for the purpose of the lecture. Let's start with shallow neural networks. A shallow neural network is a, a function that, uh, for me, it's uh, going to uh, go from Rd to R. Uh, in general, here we could uh, put a vector, but for the sake of simplicity, we go to R. And uh, the, the function is uh, defined as uh, an affine transformation times a nonlinear activation function sigma, and then uh, we take a linear, uh, final linear combination. This is the shallow neural network that uh, we all know. And uh, here, uh, just to make you remark that this shallow neural network is a nonlinear decoder in the sense that now, if I take as coefficients the vector A over here, the matrix A and B, if, if I co connect them with my previous notation of C coefficients for the decoder, uh, I, I can view the neural network as a mapping from Rn to a space V, and here V is going to be the space of functions from Rd to R, such that uh, I, I fix myself the coefficients over here and I get my mapping f. And I can then I can do here f of x uh, as uh, we are all um, uh, used to do. So they connect uh, through the previous uh, discussion through, through this observation over here. Now, uh, let's uh, further define this uh, thing. Uh, the activation functions, uh, very uh, I mean, a very popular one is this uh, ReLU function, which is uh, the max between zero and, and, uh, and the scalar value t. And uh, there's, a, there's a, an extension to this, which is called the rectifiable uh, polynomial unit, I think, of order p, which is the same as the ReLU, but I take this to the power p. And so what's interesting is that uh, ReLU and uh, REPU networks, they produce free knot splines. And I just said that, in fact, free knot splines are achieving uh, the n width of the stable manifold width. So we can already feel that they can do a lot of things because they, they already encode a family of functions which has extremely fantastic properties, which are the free knot splines. Okay, so that's uh, super good. Uh, they this family of functions, these uh, shallow neural networks, in fact, they, are, uh, they can be also understood as being a piecewise polynomial approximation on a free uh, partition of uh, Rd determined by m hyperplanes. And what I mean by this is as follows. So if, if I take 
for example, an example in which my input is two-dimensional, two uh, what is going to happen in the first layer over here is that there is a going to, if, if I take my ReLU uh, function, there is, I am going in fact to, to separate my space of R2 into, into two pieces. Where can I erase? Uh, yeah, here. In fr from the first neuron, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. So my input space is R two here, and from the first. Neuron, what happens over here is that I, am, I can define a hyperplane uh, through the coefficients of my matrix that is going to assign a constant value over here and a constant value over here. The same is uh, going to happen, but uh, for different hyperplanes in all the different intermediate layers. And then I'm going to add them all up. And in the end, uh, I am eventually going to end up with a patchwork of hyperplanes for which I am going to have uh, constant approximations in, in each of them. If I use a repu function of order p, uh, instead of being constant, I'll have here a polynomials of order p, essentially. And so this is generating this sort of patchwork through uh, the uh, coefficients a and b uh, that, that I am prescribing. And uh, so these shallow neural networks, they are already very nice because we said they in include free knot splines. And in fact, they have kind of the basic sanity check that the family of functions can have, I would say. This is the so-called universal approximation property. It says that uh, the uh, set of um, shallow neural networks with these units, when I vary all the weights, this uh, nonlinear set is, in fact, dense uh, in the continuous functions uh, in between, uh, yeah, de defining the segment uh, zero, 01. And this only if and only if sigma is not a polynomial. But for example, ReLU, hyperbolic tangent, and uh, all the stuff that we use is, is not a polynomial. So uh, this, this is uh, the first sanity check that we can do because, I mean, it's exactly the same analog as uh, the, the Weierstrass theorem that we learn about polynomials being dense also in the continuous function. So this is kind of the counterpart for, for neural networks. So this is uh, very good. And uh, this has been known already uh, for quite uh, some time. Uh, the first uh, result was probably by, by Sibenko and uh, there's uh, plenty of other results connected to this. But so with this uh, universal approximation property, we address the question, can I approximate a continuous function by a neural network? And then uh, the answer of the theorem is going to be, yes, uh, you can, provided that your sigma is not a polynomial. Very nice, but how much complexity in terms of how many terms do I need to approximate a certain function to a certain target accuracy? This, this universal uh, approximation theorem is not telling me anything. And also, can this complexity be decreased by leveraging the depth? And so these are kind of central questions for neural network approximation. And uh, I mean, I cannot claim that I have the uh, absolute complete uh, picture of what's in the field, but I'm not sure whether there's a definite answer to this question. I would like to give some elements of answer uh, with uh, some existing results. Uh, and I, I will leave it uh, open for discussion later on. So in order to discuss about the complexity and the role of depth to, uh, to improve, uh, uh, to, to, to help uh, in decreasing complexity, let me uh, now uh, introduce deep neural networks. Deep neural networks, as uh, you know, it's uh, the same as uh, shallow, but we start concatenating uh, in a fine uh, transformation of this form with uh, nonlinear activation function, and we repeat this 
through capital L layers. Uh, and uh, within each layer, we, we may have uh, dimensions that, uh, that are changing, as, as the slide is telling you. And so uh, the thing becomes uh, absolutely crazy in the sense that I said that a uh, shallow neural network is uh, producing uh, approximations on, uh, on, a, on a mesh uh, that is produced by the coefficients. And so this happens even more so when I have a deep neural network. And uh, in fact, the number of uh, piecewise domains is going to grow exponentially with the depth L. And so in the end, uh, there was, uh, for example, a, a paper in 2019 which was uh, producing a, a picture of this, uh, this uh, patch uh, of uh, the, the, the final uh, patch of a deep neural network uh, of, uh, I think, I think, I don't remember, I'm not sure if it was this architecture or something else, but I mean, so this is the thing that we should keep in mind. It really becomes very wild very quickly. So now let's discuss uh, why deep neural networks can be interesting uh, to approximate a certain function to a target accuracy very efficiently. So I have collected this uh, result, which uh, seems to me kind of uh, uh, very, uh, Ill, I mean, very pedagogical to some extent. So let's consider the following exercise. Take a function f in C3. Uh, and now uh, consider the following set. I pick all the functions g that are continuous and piecewise affine such that they are at epsilon distance in L infinity uh, from, from my function, okay? I call this uh, CPA epsilon of F. It's a terrible notation, but I was out of ideas. So now I ask myself, what is the smallest number of segments for a function G in uh, this uh, class to, 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 to approximate my F? So among the Gs that are there, uh, what's the minimal amount of oscillations I would need? And the fact is that uh, in, in this uh, result by Frensen, Sasao, and Butler, they say that the smallest uh, number of segments, uh, it is scaling as one over square root of epsilon. And uh, the funny fact is as well that is that we can characterize very nicely uh, uh, kind of a uh, proportionality factor kappa, which is connected to the second derivative of the target function f. Uh, and uh, I am unclear how to interpret this, but uh, the second uh, derivative is connected to the oscillations of the function as well. So to some extent, it looks extremely natural to, to have such a coefficient over here. So the minimal amount of uh, segments that I need to approximate my function scale as 1 over epsilon. So now let us count how many oscillations I can produce with a shallow neural network and with a deep neural network. And we will see that with a deep neural network, we will be much more better off. And this will kind of be much more economic in degrees of freedom. So to see this, let me introduce the saw function. The saw, the sawtooth function is this pyramid over here, it starts at zero and finishes at one, and in the middle it takes the value one. This function can be expressed as uh, two uh, mini ReLU units, and of course I can take this function and compose it with itself, and it's uh, going to produce two, uh, two peaks, and if I compose it with itself again, it's going to uh, uh, give me four peaks, and in fact, if I compose it m times, I am going to get 2 to the power m oscillations. So the message is that composing m times results in an exponential amount of oscillations in, uh, created in the neural network. So why is this so cool? For my purposes, this is fantastic, because now I'm asked to uh, produce 1 over square root of epsilon oscillations. How many, oscilla how many uh, compositions do I need uh, with my deep neural network to produce these oscillations? I only need logarithm of 1 over square root of epsilon. 
Okay? So think of, for example, uh, epsilon being 10 to the minus 2. It's already fairly small. Okay? 10 to the minus 2. Uh, so uh, this is uh, going to be logarithm of order 10. So it's not going to be so much. Okay? So this has to be compared to having to uh, produce uh, 1 over uh, square root of uh, epsilon, which is uh, going to be of the order, uh, how much is that then? Uh, 100 or, or so. Okay, so I mean, uh, this is kind of a very strong argument in favor of saying, if you have a function that has plenty of oscillations, neural networks are a good tool and it is good to go deep. For many other examples, uh, I'm personally not sure uh, whether going deep is better or not. There are numerical evidences that tend to suggest it's good. I am not aware of such a clear picture from the approximation theory side to, to kind of uh, explain everything. Now, uh, let me move to parametric manifolds VN based on neural networks. Here, I mean, it's a slide which is, uh, I'm not very happy with it, but the message here is that I want to define this notation phi of LM and this is going to be the class of neural networks with depth L and that have intermediate widths M1, M2, M capital L. And so for this architecture I am going to define Vn as the class of neural networks that belong uh, to, to, to this uh, architecture. Okay? And so what I want to do with this is uh, to connect this class now to best approximation and to, uh, and to training. Suppose I take uh, as a Hilbert space uh, L2, just uh, to simplify, and I take my class of uh, neural networks with uh, fixed uh, depth and uh, given uh, here I'm taking in fact uh, fixed uh, width for, for, for all the layers. Now, if I want to approximate a given function u uh, with the class of neural networks, then uh, the best I can do is to find the neural network V from the class that is at uh, smallest distance from my target U. So how does this read? Since uh, my family of functions over here, it is parametrized by uh, the affine transformations, the coefficients in there, so I have to infimize over all these coefficients and I replace this element of, of the class by the explicit formula for the neural network. So this uh, resembles uh, very much to the formulas that we have when we train, of course, and in practice, instead of uh, making an exact integral over here, we throw n random points xi in our domain uh, because uh, either omega is a very uh, complicated domain or also because we don't know our target function u pr precisely uh, everywhere, so we, we only know certain uh, random observations. And in the end, we can see that uh, what I was introducing in the beginning as, as a very uh, abstract object uh, for, the, for the best approximation, this is no more, no less approximated by what we are doing in, in the training phase, which is fairly obvious, of course, but I, I just wanted to emphasize. Uh, this minimization problem that we end up in the end raises plenty of questions I'm not going to cover in the course, namely about optimization and uh, generalization, because I, I, I don't see everything over here. I, I replace this integral by, by this discrete sum, and uh, the optimization is uh, highly non-convex and technically non-differentiable as well. So it's a mess. Um, I will uh, kind of uh, finish this uh, first part by uh, collecting some interesting facts that are known uh, about deep neural networks uh, from approximation theory. So there's uh, many results uh, on the expressivity of uh, neural networks. Uh, the approximation classes of uh, deep uh, neural networks uh, of uh, free depth and fixed width, these approximation classes, they are larger than the ones 
uh, that we can approximate with shallow neural networks. So there's an interest in going deep because we can reach uh, more uh, functions. There's uh, been produced plenty of emulation results in which uh, we confirm that uh, deep neural networks are as expressive as many of the classical approximation families like <coughs> polynomials, free knot splines, and so on. Uh, they achieve new to optimal performance for functions from classical smoothness classes. And by classical smoothness classes, I, I, uh, I mean these uh, unit balls of uh, Sobolev spaces and and so on. Uh, and uh, we have identified uh, functions beyond the classical smoothness classes that are well approximated by deep neural networks. In particular, I know, for example, a very nice uh, paper by Devor, Dobeshis, and uh, Foucault, I think, I don't remember, in which uh, they explain why deep neural networks can uh, approximate well Takagi functions which are terrible functions because they are not differentiable at any point. So that's kind of a very remarkable fact. Now, there are a few surprises. And uh, one is connected to the remark I, I received a couple of minutes ago. Uh, here's, here's one surprising thing. <laughs> um, if I take uh, functions that are infinitely many times uh, differentiable, sorry, no, so what is this? So that are k times differentiable, sorry, in uh, the L infinity sense. There was recently a result that kind of uh, made some, some noise in the field. The, the result was saying that uh, we can approximate elements u of this class at a rate uh, that decays as one over n to the power p, where p uh, has to be smaller than 2k over d. OK, what does this mean? It means the following. So connect this with the uh, claim that we say that the stable manifold width of uh, this uh, family, in fact, we said that it decays at the rate 1 over k over d, and not better. And so this result was giving us a 2 in front of the power. Uh, right? So it's, it's a larger power, it's technically better. Uh, why so? What is going on? Is there something wrong with the result? Which one of them is wrong? <laughs> or what happened? So there's no contradiction. In fact, uh, if I claim that I have a rate of approximation p that is better than k over d, this is possible, but it can only be achieved with a discontinuous parameter selection. Again, saying that if you want to overcome the classical approximation uh, results here and uh, fight a, a bit against the curse of dimension by squeezing a 2 over here, uh, then you need to go with this continuous parameter selection, meaning that you need to accept that uh, you are not going to be always robust against noise. Do we want to do this? Do we not? I don't know, but uh, these are the known facts. Uh, it's uh, kind of very intriguing, I think. In addition to this, there's uh, this intriguing result uh, by Peter Sen and a collaborator saying there's a theory to practice gap, they call it. They say no matter how high the theoretically possible approximation rate may be with neural networks, um, one requires in practice an exponential quantity of samples u of xi in order to realize this optimal approximation rate. So, so does this mean that we all have to go cry to our rooms <laughs> and stop uh, working? I don't think so in the sense that uh, somehow I guess uh, this result has been uh, produced for a very, uh, in, a, in an extremely general setting. And uh, with uh, sampling techniques, that uh, could be maybe uh, adapted if we consider maybe more uh, specifically a given problem. So I'm going to conclude with this personal interpretation of the state of uh, things here. In fact, I think that uh, we need to study uh, deep neural network approximation for 
more specific uh, model classes and derive uh, more closed forms in order to avoid as much as possible these uh, humongous optimization problems and to overcome the course of dimension but for maybe smaller classes. Uh, and this hopefully will truly justify the use of uh, neural networks uh, in, uh, that will allow us to, to really uh, bring to practice uh, all their uh, approximation power. This concludes the uh, first part of the lecture. Uh, just as a quick summary, I would like to insist for the rest of the lecture, linear approximation means we work with a class Vn which is linear, the Kolmogorov and width is uh, the measure for uh, linear optimal approximation. For parametric PDEs, this Kolmogorov width decays exponentially fast when the solution manifold M over here uh, is generated by an elliptic problem. And for nonlinear approximation, I insist everything that is not linear, it's nonlinear, it falls over here. It's usually generated by encoders and decoders. There's a manifold width and a stable counterpart for it, for which if we want to be stable, we are going to be hit by the curse of dimension. And neural networks are a particular approximation, nonlinear approximation class there, which has fantastic emulation properties. It produces many oscillations and uh, uh, it seems that it goes beyond approximating classical smoothness classes. But for me, the, the, the picture is still kind of uh, being built. So with this, I'm going to conclude. And if there are any questions, let me know. So we have time for questions. And uh, for those who are attending online, you can ask questions in the uh, chat window other or alternatively on the Slack channel. And we'll repeat them loudly for the others. So please. Thank you, Olga, for your lecture. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if you want to approximate functions that are defined on RD, but not on simple sets like a box, 0, 1 to the D, but more complex sets, I mean, what are the current state of the art? Uh? I, I don't know, Alexandre. I don't know. Uh, I'm not aware that uh, the classical results really cover uh, this aspect. And uh, one person that is currently working on this is uh, Albert Cohen, I don't know if you know, with uh, his questions about optimal sampling. Uh, he's uh, producing works on optimal sampling for general sets that are not tensor products. Uh, beyond this kind of works, I really don't know. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Hey, thanks for the lecture. I, I really loved it. Um, maybe a philosophical question, but so neural networks works, work well in practice. Do you believe it's because the classes of function they approximate for the problems we are interested in is very special? Or do you believe that they do something extraordinary that we don't comprehend yet? Or maybe a combination of both? I'm not sure what to answer to you uh, in the sense that uh, I don't think that um, for me what's failing are these uh, optimization routines. It's not clear what they do and this is why it becomes alchemy in the end of the day uh, to some extent. Um, I have the impression to tell the truth that for uh, many examples that we see, many pictures that we see, uh, in many examples, one could have probably used another approximation class, which is simpler, less nonlinear, and it would worked uh, as well. So uh, for me, uh, many results that are produced are not really justifying uh, the power of uh, neural networks. For example, I believe uh, in uh, using neural networks to solve uh, conservation laws and problems where you have strong discontinuities because, of course, with a ReLU network, with only a couple of ReLUs, you can already uh, capture the shock very well. 
Um, but I have the impression that uh, this is being kind of overused at the moment, and that uh, sometimes it's not really justified. That's if this is uh, kind of answers to some extent the question. Other questions? First of all, thank you, Olga, for your first lecture. Very nice. Thank you. And uh, a question about the slide 13. Oh. Uh, just, uh, okay, here. Uh, for this, about the stable manifold uh, width, in particular, the mm, in the two last inequalities, the constant uh, gamma. Uh, what, uh, what is the magnitude of this constant uh, above uh, uh, the threshold of this constant above which we talk about uh, we have uh, instability? Is it, para is it problem dependent or is there a general uh, uh, average? This is a very abstract definition, okay. right? So uh, the gamma, you could take it as you wish, as long as it's positive. <laughs> uh, the closer to zero, of course, <laughs> the, the more stable you'll be. Uh, um, I don't have a specific number to give to you. Uh, uh, it's uh, probably the, the best way to, to understand this result is to keep in mind that uh, there's uh, this continuity constant that can enter into the picture and uh, that is indeed when uh, gamma becomes large for a value that probably depends on your problem, you, you are going to go from one uh, regime of stable manifold width to the other one. I, I cannot give you uh, an indication of, of the value. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Uh, is it possible to interpolate between like the manifold width and the stable width with something like a modulus of continuity or? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, for me, in fact, really, uh, when you go to the manifold width, yeah. it's uh, even rather than saying that gamma goes large, I would even say that you are not Lipschitz. Yeah. So there exist uh, pairs of coefficients uh, C and Q for which uh, this is not satisfied. Or, but could we, like, instead of using Lipschitzness, could we use like a modulus of continuity to find like, an intermediate space between the two? Of course, uh, you, you, I mean, you can refine this definition and throw here a modulus of continuity. Um, but it's, uh, again, to, to the best of my knowledge, not really uh, help you go from one to the other. Thank you. Yeah. But maybe it's possible, but I'm, I'm not sure, and I, I don't think it's the way you really should see it. Yeah, that's it. So you said that in deep neural networks, uh, with the composition of ReLU functions, they can oscill approximate oscillating functions really well. Um, but uh, are there problems with overfitting, let's say, because neural networks are typically trained with a train test split, so the deeper you go, uh, are you worried about like overfitting on the data and them not generalizing well into the test data, are the results talking about this? That? So I didn't uh, speak about uh, overparametrization <coughs> or uh, generalization. Indeed, somehow uh, in this, uh, in the philosophy, uh, that I have, in the point of view I have adopted here, uh, you see I really want to approximate a given function at the best accuracy I can, right? So to some extent if I'm working with a family of functions, if I go like a beast to a, a bunch of, only a subset of these functions in my training, I may then have uh, problems in generalization, right? So this is not covered in, in, in this discussion, but uh, in practice, it's, it's going to happen. And uh, th there are results of uh, people trying to understand this kind of behavior, but this is not covered by, by the current point of view somehow. Yeah. So the 
is an online question. I will read it loud. So when outperforming the stable width, doesn't it only implies that parameter selection is non-Lipschitz continuous, while you said that it implies non-continuous? Uh, I mean, if if I'll, I'll try to maybe rephrase, I, I just meant to say that when you are, for example, in an optimization setting in which you are discovering the widths of your neural network, uh, these widths they are kind of represented here by this coefficient c or q. If uh, I, my, my optimization uh, routine is, uh, say it is stagnating and uh, it doesn't seem to do much and uh, the coefficients are kind of not varying so much and I may have the impression it is fine, but if I don't have this kind of uh, continuity over here, uh, a, a very slight change might induce a, a dramatic uh, change in the output uh, and this is what I was trying to convey through through this uh, Lipschitz uh, continuity, but I'm not sure I'm answering the question. Is it okay? Do you have other remark? No, it's okay. <laughs>